All right, uh, thanks guys. Um, so yesterday, uh, people only had very little time to actually solve the shallow water equation. And uh, because I hardly think that people will want to solve this over the weekend, I'm going to walk you through the solution. <clears throat> However, if you still want to solve this spoiler free, then you might want to, to mute this presentation for 15 minutes. Um, either way, so yesterday, um, there was a bit of confusion about the, the governing equations themselves because we managed to introduce um, one more typo or rather like the, convenient, um, the convention used in the software is not the convention used in the resources. So in 90% of shallow water resources, uh, the right hand side would both be minus here. And yesterday I told you to put the minus on the top and neglect the minus on the bottom. And I had to do this because the um, binder has a reference stored as a text file. And this was generated using the uh, plus at the bottom and the minus on top. However, um, from a physical standpoint, this one, the bottom one should always be minus. And the top one should be minus or plus, depending on whether the uh, gravitational acceleration is positive or negative for you. And the driver code puts minus uh, 9.8 as the uh, acceleration towards Earth. So this is where this confusion um, came from. Anyways, we're going to publish the solution binder like around 3 or 4 this afternoon. And there it is fixed. So there you can use this equation set and the references are correct um, with respect to these equations. So anyways, now without further ado, uh, we provided this um, skeleton where we are, um, where, we, where we see what we were supposed to implement. Um, and it's for this one, we uh, neglected the time stepper because the time stepper is in the driver code. So all that we're going to implement is uh, starting from the interpolation step up until the build up equation step, and then we would be done. So first, um, to interpolate, for example, our height field onto the edges, we use this familiar sum over concept, which you have seen a lot of times now. We simply use the uh, height field on cells as our operands. And we get these interpolation weights provided. So because it's just an interpolation from uh, two places to one, and interpolation weights need to add up to one, we can just uh, use one field for this, and we don't need any complicated uh, sparse dimensions. So um, for the other quantities, that is for the velocity, let me put you maybe first and V second. So this would be U on the cells and V on the cells. We do the exact same thing. So this would be our blurb step. Then as a second step, if we look at our plan again, we need to find the spatial derivatives which means that we need to solve this blue thing here and this green thing here. And this we exercised also quite a bit. So this is um, the gradient, the height field gradient, which we need to do, which we can find by using our sum over, this time in the other um, direction. Like for each cell, we are looking at three edges. We multiply the edge value by the edge length and by the normal. And we need to make sure that this normal points outside, right? And divide by the area. We're doing the same thing for the Y component, where we just need to change the normal component we are looking at. All right, and this is enough to compute the height field gradient. Next up, we would compute the divergence of the velocity field. 
And you remember that this looks very similar, so we're just going to copy, paste, and start from a from the gradient. So the variable we are supposed to fill is uv on cells divergence. This is the same iteration space as the gradient. However, what is different is we have to not consume a scalar field, but we consume a vector field. And in fact, we need to build the dot product um, with the outside normal, so v times an i. And also in this case, we need to respect the edge orientation, multiply by the length, divide by the area. All right, and then we're almost there. Um, this is close to our equation system, but not quite. If we take a quick peek again, we see that we have the gravitational constant here and here the height field itself. So build up ODEs. So OCD equals the gravity constant, which already has a minus in there. HC, HC, X. Right, that should be correct. Then we have HCT, which is the time evolution of the height field, which is the height field itself, uh, UVC times the divergence. And now this would obviously go sideways because I totally forgot about one block. Like actually here in subtle red, it says that we should enforce some boundary conditions. So let's do that. And in order to not drag this out, I'm going to copy paste them if this is fine. So basically we're just stating that we have zero velocity boundaries and we have zero gradient at the boundaries. So, and this should actually, if I didn't mess up, then this should solve the shallow water equations. Let's see if it compiles. Okay, so let's not panic. Scroll through three pages of stack trace and then, sheesh. Okay, undeclared variable u. That's very correct because we never use u, but we always state where, uh, where u lives, right? So where is it here? Here I was trying, so this would be u, e, and v, e, right? Let's give it another go. No success. So either I made the same mistake twice or I didn't properly re-execute that cell. So if UE, UE here. Actually, I don't see it. So let's just give this another go. Yes, I just didn't properly re-execute that cell. Okay, so assuming we have no box in our pipeline, make should complete cleanly and it does. We are testing against the references, which just have the first time step serialized, and we see that everything we computed is correct. So we can visualize now. So before we can visualize, we need to execute some time steps. About halfway done. Okay, and now let's render this into an HTML5 video, and we should be rewarded, be rewarded with some waves, which uh, will hopefully, hopefully, not completely diverge in the middle of the simulation. Let's see. Okay, so. This looks more or less convincing to me. That's for wa what waves are supposed to look like, right? Okay, and uh, this would conclude my walkthrough through the uh, shallow water solver. So, thanks, thanks for your atten attention. Uh, 
stop sharing and head the word back to Carlos. Thank you, Matthias. Very good. Um, as said, you will, everyone will get the, the solutions and exercises, but I, it was good to do this last uh, go through um, with explanations. Very good. Then I propose we enter into more like the general question sessions and kind of a round table. Um, feel free to open your cameras if you like. If you like to talk, feel free to take the mic. If you like to bring the questions, and at the same time, we can also, there were some questions written in the doc, that's also fine. Uh, I can take the, those questions to people on the floor. So whichever way you prefer. And I see we have already Ruger, Andy, Giacomo, Matias, probably missing Ben. Is there anyone else missing from your side? Like Eva is connecting, uh, Ruger? I don't think he was going to be able to make it or um, Sergi either. So I think Andy and myself will have to cover Sergio. it. Pretty good. Then if, if that's fine, I can take uh, one first question that Rene already wrote uh, while we were going through the last demo. Uh, so he's asking, well, he's saying like he learned quite a lot about the DSL approaches that are running in our community so far. And he's asking you developers if you could share your thoughts about how we should go in the future. Cyclone and that can don't differ in their approaches. So do you see a change, a chance to finally end up with one way to go? So maybe, yeah, feel free to, do you want me to relate the question? So you can just jump in. Cooper, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so so um, I think I think Andy gave a slide in one of his presentations, which which sort of starts to address this problem. I mean, I think what one of the, one of the points is is that um, is that different um, different parts of the community in different places. So some some people in the community will be looking to develop an, a new code. Some people will um, will, will be wanting to refactor an existing code. Some people will want to be to be staying with their with their code. So I think depending on where they are, there's going to be a different answer, at least for a while. Um, I guess the other, the other point is, is it's not completely clear whether DSLs are the ultimate future, but let's just pretend they are because we're all DSL people, so we are the future. Um, so um, with that, I, I, think, I think my opinion is, is that we should be looking to go for higher levels of abstraction as, as, um, uh, as time goes on. So I think ultimately we should be looking at as high level as possible. So so what um, so what Dusk and, and Dawn does I think is 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 really good and really powerful. I mean the high the high level you can of abstraction you can go the more flexibility you have in in, in optimizing and, and things like that. So the more power you have. So I'm I'm very into declarative programming and um, and so so I think ultimately that's where um, it would be nice to be able to get to. Um, it'd be interesting to hear what people's views are about high-level uh, interfaces versus lower-level ones, but that, that's what I think. Um, but I think there's a very long, a very long training path to get there. So I think for a while um, there will be uh, uh, benefits in in supporting existing codes and, um, and and people who want to continue to do optimizations in a more traditional style. As well as as well as the other ones, so I think I think it's a gradual migratory path, and it could be 10, 15 years worth of of, of that. So that that'll be my summary. Thank you very much, Rupert. Maybe if I can also uh, complement that um, as as where to go in the future. I mean, when we started in the project, um, the cyclone and and the dusk and dawn approaches, we're wondering about interoperability, whether we could do more efforts to inter really interoperate and have a unique model on, on intermediate representations and so on. And as you have seen that we are exploring that path. Nevertheless, the redundancy of tools, because they cover completely different requirements, as Rupert was saying, like uh, bringing people that are already existing here that are running alone, and maybe one is Fortran, the other one is more Python, but not only that, but also the methods. It's not 
I, I don't think that that's my opinion, right? That we have proven that we can come up with a single DSL, a single tool that can support all the all the models that we have around. One of the problems that we are facing is that actually the diversity in discretization methods, in methods, algorithms, and so on is, is really large. And this is a challenge for the DSL because the broader the domain is, the more difficult it is to come up with a tool that is efficient, that gives you portable and performance portable code, and that is expressive. So I don't think we have proven that, and, and at, at this point in time, it's actually not a bad idea that, that tools develop, um, supporting or having different set of, or being in, in different places of the face space of possibilities. And the future is probably long-term future until these tools uh, consolidate, they become mature, and if potentially they become de facto a solution for models, or, or maybe not, or maybe not. But uh, at least from our side, also, we have a long history. We started with grid tools, proposing template metaprogramming. Um, the grid tools was a template metaprogramming DSL, written in C++. And, and then these things are actually, the technology is evolving quite a lot. Also, as we develop the tools, there is new technology in computer science that uh, to express DSL that before was not possible. So it's quite, quite a rapid change in environment. To add to that, anyone? Um, yeah, maybe I just wanted to um, offer some more general thoughts that, I mean, whether or not, while I agree that the, the cyclone and dawn is not completely orthogonal, they're still like a little bit in different worlds as we have seen. But um, still, if you look at the rest of the world, um, it's not like that the whole world converges like, to one program lang programming language, actually. Quite uh, the opposite is true. It's like uh, new programming languages um, entering the game uh, with lots of um, overlapping um, domains. So just as I don't think that humanity will converge against one universal programming language, I also do not think that there will be one universal DSL. And another thought, which was also um, just like outlined by Carlos as well, the S in DSL stands for specific, right? And the more specific you get, the more leverage you have to like, the more assumptions you can make, uh, the more leverage you have against the uh, optimizations. So when you go too general, you may, may leave a lot of the advantages that DSLs offer behind, and we would end up maybe with something too close again to the uh, current model code, which we need to, well, write in DSL, but then annotate again or, or something, some compromise like this. So I do not think that this uh, one approach to rule them, them all um, is in the in the near future. Yeah, so I I completely agree with that. I, I think we can we can probably um, and I think Carlos mentioned this. We can probably think about DSLs as not just being a, a, a single thing. Um, you know, the, the front ends are going to be different because they're different domains. That's clear. You don't want to to have a finite element front end is going to have different properties to a finite difference one, for example. So they're going to be different. I think one of the questions is, is can we can we then go from a relatively thin front end uh, into something that could potentially be have have the uh, shared some sort of intermediate representation? And I, and I think Matteo Swiss um, started this off very early. Um, which is really good, the, the kind of the idea of an SIR and an HIR. We kind of followed that because um, that fits in very well. And, and that's why um, in the work we're doing in Easy Waste, we're looking at whether or not there's any uh, interoperability at these levels. Because I think if you can do that, then you can start sharing some of the back end um, things as well. But I think the front ends will be different for different um, domains. And, and um, yeah, I guess one of the questions is how many Really, how many DSLs can we support in the community? And I, and I would say we should try and converge wherever, where possible, but we will end up having different front ends, um, definitely. I actually would like to add two things to that. So I think, first of all, um, the DSL projects they suffer from basically the same thing that many other projects can suffer from. And basically, their 
done by different institutes with institutes with different goals and motivations. Um, so it, it, sometimes, basically, I mean, the, in essence, they're all trying very similar things, but then they ca there can be also natural differences because some some um, institutes have different goals and, and motivations. And but I think that's uh, the same can be said for. Uh, I think that's just a, a fact of reality, or or, so, or just a something a challenge that's not easy to resolve um, and that's not specific to DSLs but that's just in general and, and I think we can there are other um, areas where this happens so some of it is natural because of that but I think the the second point is also that um, I think you can you can have a goal um, and, and maybe maybe and I think even if you have a goal you still need a roadmap to get there so even if we right now had like the perfect DSL we still need a way to figure out how to get um, model developers to to to, to use um, such tools, right? And I think there, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be that we go from what we have now to to kind of the perfect solution. Maybe you need to take some intermediate steps. And I think it's important that we connect with the model developers and also because I think there's a, also a huge of um, a lot of I, th I think um, I don't know how to, how to put this, but I think at the end of the day, the model developers develop the models, right? So we need to we need to work with them, and and and, and maybe we can't just have a black and night, a black and white overnight uh, transition, right? Maybe it does need to, um, a few steps to to get there, and um, I think these steps are a, are a real thing that also we need to address. But that's that's also why it's really nice to to have this exchange with with model developers and and, and really try to to work. Um, I think. We should uh, appeal to, or uh, yeah, we should really try to work with each other. And I think, um, yeah, that should be a really good, big goal of ours. Pretty good. Shall I pick up then another question? There's another one from Sebastian. Um, I think I was reading through, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Sebastian, I'm interpreting what you wrote. Uh, so basically, he's saying um, it's about Dask and Don. Uh, he finds that the Dask neighborhood change an elegant concept uh, for for expressing in a concise manner your your code. However, he had a, a little bit of issues understanding the weights or some of the syntax by the weight, right? And every time he was writing the code, he had to think about what this implies for the concepts and probably not being certain that what he was writing was actually what he was intending. I'm, I'm summarizing a bit for the time I'm reading the entire thing. So I, I think he's suggesting um, that these issues could be improved significantly by giving users an option to visualize the code reductions. So basically similar to the sketches on the presentation slide. So what, I, what I'm understanding is that if you would write the DSL code, and then you'd have a way to actually visualize graphically what that means as an operation for reduction, and that would greatly help the the model developer to understand or to double check. Ah, actually, yeah, that's exactly what I meant. So he's asking if this would be an option for the future, or if people consider that. Um, yeah, maybe I can take this because uh, I mean this is a feature which I have been uh, having in the back of my head for a long time now, and we also briefly discussed this. And I mean it, it's certainly very possible that we will just scan all the um, reductions which are in there, and for all of them which we find, we would um, if you provide a certain compiler flag, we would dump a GraphOS file or whatever which it can then use to look at well what you wrote. Yes, I think this is something which we should consider for the future, and this is also something which is uh, very useful. I mean, so far, this is also the first time that we really had people working with Dusk and Dawn, which aren't like us. And um, I mean, this is maybe also not on the top of our priority list, because so far, it's more like that you already have an existing code, and you translate it into Dawn. And then you would probably already have a better idea um, about what you want to reduce and how, and then map it, right? And it's less like that you have an abstract um, description of an algorithm and you need to come up with the dust code. So there it's maybe not as um, crucial even in that perspective, but still useful. But yes, I, I do agree as soon as you have a neighbor chain longer than say three or four, 
if I would need to implement this in Dusk, um, then I would make a picture first on on my notes, right, to see what's going on. And yes, I mean, you have seen that also the tooling during the exercises, that the error messages aren't nice. Sometimes it tells you the error is at line minus one. So especially in this ecosystem stuff, in this tooling stuff, we see a lot of room for improvement. Yes, there you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sebastian. My suggestion. Uh, maybe I can hook you in to say, well, I will give some final remarks, uh, but there's going to be some communication, some email uh, back to the participants. And I'd encourage the, the developers to suggest a way to, I mean, for sure, all the participants are going to have very valuable feedback to, to you guys, I mean, like things like that. So you can think of um, how you go back to the participants asking, like, how do you provide that feedback? Do you have public repositories where you are developing, like maybe like in GitHub or I don't know? Uh, you can suggest to use issues or to recommend people or maybe to directly contact you. But we will do that for sure to, to collect all this feedback. It's probably fair to say that it's the first time that we're exposing these tools to a large community. Then let's gonna pick another question. Now is Gis asking like many EFMs, time integration algorithms involve solving some linear system at some point, and often one uses external libraries or packages to do the algebraic work. So do the DSLs address this step too, or or is that be left out for the driver code external to a DSL? I don't know whether my microphone's Andy? working. Is it working? Yeah, work. Yeah. Ah, it's not showing the screen for me, but uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So I can only speak for Cyclone, but in Cyclone we do have this concept of built-in operations that are essentially linear algebra operations on fields at the minute. And at the minute, Cyclone generates those in line in Fortran. But obviously that's a choice, and we could choose to use some other linear algebra library if we wish to, but we haven't taken that step yet. Yeah, and, and we're aware that there are solver libraries out there. It, the issue we would have is is that typically um, solver libraries like Petsy or something like that, um, they have their own view of how to parallelize things. So what you'd have to do is you'd have to align however it's been parallelized with there. So there'll be some interface between the two. Um, but of course, being a DSL, we can we can generate the code to do that, but there may be some um, performance issues associated with that. But um, just to extend, so so as Andy said, we can we can integrate those things in. Um, so it is certainly possible, um, but there could be potentially be some performance issues. I'm not sure if this is what you have had in mind, but also there are some small matrix uh, linear algebra inside your parallel or main parallel looping, right? Or in this continuous galerian, you can have uh, degrees of freedom, extra dimensions, and then do these matrix operations inside. But that, that's a good point that you bring, right? That whatever you do, it should not interfere with the parallel model that the DSL is already expressing, right? So is that what you're saying that potentially it's possible as far as the library call that you make does not do any parallel implementation? And it has some interoperability in terms of like data layouts and things like that. Yeah, I was I was saying that um, we could recognize a call to a library because um, we're we're Fortran, um, and and I mean it, you can write it whatever way you want to. But we could recognize that and then call the the library itself in the appropriate way. Um, Andy already said at the moment we have this concept of built-ins, which are things that we already recognize and we generate the code for them. But we could, instead of generating the code for them, we could link in with an existing library and recognize that. So that would mean that no one would have to write any any code. They would just write the interface to the library, and then we would make sure that um, that it interfaced properly between uh, previous code and the library code. Mm -hmm. Any answer for the Dask and the environment? They are probably different. Yeah, I think uh, maybe. One could think also of uh, writing the library in the DSL. So may maybe we could do that as developer of Dawn to just uh, maybe provide uh, the operators that you um, uh, that you wrote in, in, uh, in the exercises uh, as a library uh, that you can reuse, for example, um, and thus making the, the language more 
complete um, and yeah share a lot of code uh, so also yeah the, there is this possibility if you are more inclined to use libraries to use libraries within the dsl Mm -hmm. Yeah, so probably everybody. Go ahead. Sorry, I mean, I don't really see that like uh, linear algebra libraries are going to be rewritten in, in Dusk, but I uh, maybe wanted to stress the other possibility that even uh, now we are supporting external function calls from uh, within Dusk. Um, so, yeah, I mean, these things do not need to be uh, mutually exclusive, in my opinion. Maybe a related question, right? Uh, even more fundamental, probably. Why DSLs are not just libraries? So you have a problem like Blast is providing solutions. Why not providing a library and just calling that library? Hi, I can say something about that. Um, so, so what, one of the things I think is very powerful with DSLs is they essentially um, apply a whole code um, solution and optimization. Um, if you're talking about doing an individual library, then typically you optimize within that library with, without any, any information or, or knowledge or, or concept about what's outside the library. And so, as I said before, you know, if, if we used Petsy or Blas or something, then they're going to have their own parallelization. They're going to have their own optimization. Whereas, whereas if you have a DSL, you have much more power across the whole, the whole code to do, to do things. And I think that's, very powerful um, and, and a big advantage. Um, I would like to add to this. <clears throat> I think it's a very, very valid and good question. <clears throat> and um, I, I, I really understand um, why this uh, having this as a library is um, a lot more convenient for developers, right? You are already familiar with this language. You, you don't have to learn a lang new language or like in a way, the language is like a, it's like a mental model, right? And you already have it. Whereas if you have to learn a, a DSL, you kind of need to learn and relearn the a new mental model and then kind of the rules that apply to this DSL. Um, and I think uh, to a certain extent, what we're doing with the DSLs um, could be achievable one way or another um, with libraries. But I also feel like the it's an issue of limitations. It's, at some point, you're just just too limited if you do this as a library, and if you are able to kind of create this like as, as a new language, you you have much more flexibility. And and maybe a specific example I could give would be, for example, in Dusk, we write those we either write those um, neighbor chains with um, the, the the bigger sign, right? So this is this is actually a logical operator, right? In, in Python, if you use a the bigger sign, then this is a, a logical operator, and then it should should to give you a, a truth value whether it, something is bigger than the other thing right and in this case we, we gave this operator a new meaning in, in dusk right we said well actually this doesn't like compare to location types and tells me which location type is bigger but it it means like a jump and then i can i can add them and when i add them more then i i, I get like bigger location chains right um and in some languages it's possible to even do that right for example c plus plus has operator overloading and python has it too and we, we um we we kind of indirectly use Python's operator overlay loading um, to help the IDE understand this concept better. But but because but but it's much easier in the DSL to to assign this new meaning to this to this operator. Um, and because of that, we can we can give Dusk like a more ergonomic feel, right? Like if you look at the neighbor chain, you don't think about well, edge is bigger than cell. You you think about well, we go from edges to cells, right? Um, and and that kind of shows us how in DSLs we have we have much more freedom to 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 do things um, specific to a domain and and we can do them so that it suits this domain really well and I think that's just uh, a fun that's I think that's a really big trade-off between libraries which allow the original developers not having to change their mon mental model versus DSLs where we can really where we have a lot of freedom to 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 at language constructs that suit this domain very well and that overall will give a much well give will give much more freedom with respect to what we can do with optimizations and how we can express these domain specific um things such as neighbor chains and, and, and there's many other examples that we can 
where we can create language elements that express these concepts very, very well. Um, and maybe, maybe to 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 go a little bit further, um, because I think one 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 issue with with Dusk and Dawn is kind of the, always the question of well, do I have to rewrite my model? You know, <laughs> do I have to like delete all my code and, and then I have to add the, all this other code that is in Dusk and Dawn, right? And I think that's 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 the, I mean a very valid and, and legitimate concern in my opinion, and and I think there it's also it's it's really hard to 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 give a good answer there because on the one hand side you kind of you want to have this high level expressions where you get this um, performance portability of on, on different hardwares right on the other hand well how does that work with existing code right and I mean. <laughs> You can you can ask yourself, well, okay, where do you put the dust code, right? Well, you can create a new folder, put all the dust code in there, right? Now you have two versions of the same code, one dust and one what you had before. So you have two code clones. That's not good, right? So what you could do is, well, we could um, we could add all the dust code and add it as comments inside of the existing code, right? And and I think like that's kind of the the approach of of directives, right? Like open ACC and open MP, they're kind of part of the code, but they're kind of also comments, and so they're they're kind of inside the code, but they're inside of the comments. Um, but then you just kind of you kind of already go a bit the directives approach, and all of a sudden you have like you, the thing with directives is that you kind of you have one code, one one text file, but it's actually multiple codes, right? And and then it's really hard to kind of maintain this. Um, and and if you do it in comments, I I feel like it's very questionable whether that would be really beneficial. And kind of the third way that you could do is you you go to the some Fortran standards committee and you make a suggestion to add your language feature officially to the officially supported Fortran standard, which is unlikely to happen. Um, and 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 I mean that would be the most uh, integrated approach, right? Where you actually say, well, I I take actual Fortran, and now neighbor chains are like first class citizen in, in Fortran code, and, and reductions are first class citizen, and then. Well, then you can rewrite your Fortran code with with all your new added standards, but that's also well, yeah. I mean, it's questionable whether you even whether that's feasible. Firstly, and secondly, um, you kind of well, then you you kind of added your your DSL a, a bit to Fortran, and you're kind of back to well, you're kind of back to writing a DSL in some way. Um, and to be honest, I feel like there's the heart truth is I don't think there's a very good answer to that. And I think the reason for that is is that that it's just it's yeah it's, it's maybe it's not it's not really possible but this is maybe the price that you have to pay for this flexibility right yeah, like you cannot cannot write your code in a new DSL and, and kind of not not have co clones at some point you need to you need to answer this hard question of well do you want to get get this freedom and and, and maybe for this very big freedom there's there's a certain price to be paid and and maybe someone really smart will figure out something but but i've i put some time into this question and i feel like yeah at some point hard questions have to be answered and then maybe it's not possible to kind of get um i don't know get the cake and eat it yourself <laughs> i don't know how the go saying goes right but but just get, mm -hmm. get everything i think that's just a really hard thing to do yeah good reflection but i think probably you were comparing dsls with you were even beyond the question right comparing dsls with other programming models like directives for parallel codes uh, with programming language, which was also what we discussed on the first, uh, like another possibility would be that the programming language itself like support um, all these concepts. Uh, but probably, uh, and there is like, there are different solutions and DSL, we are always saying that DSL is only one, but probably I dare to say that in the comparison to the library, there is completely different because the library the library removes all the freedom because in the library you can only make a library call that is sold the dicor. Basically, the DSL is abstracting pretty much all the implementation and parallelization details and the architecture, but it's not abstracting the numerics so the algorithm that that belongs to the model developer. But the library is also abstracting that, and that's probably a requirement like a no go, right? Like the model developers they still need to be able to decide what is the algorithm, what is the discretization level. Yeah, I agree. I mean, to me, if you have a library, then that says you know precisely what you're doing and you have something that goes off and does it for you. Whereas, obviously, models are developing all the time and you need you need to allow for that freedom. If, you know, you can't constrain it. Right. Can I, can I enter the discussion? Because the question was was from me and I, I, I want to uh, 
into something um, that was said earlier that um, um, maybe the, the biggest problem for me wouldn't be to start rewriting the model. The, the biggest problem for me is more that it's you put your code into a black box that, uh, well, it seems like a black box that uh, produces um, a, a new code. Uh, whereas in a library, I can, I, well, if it's open source, uh, I can click and see what goes wrong, for instance, or why it doesn't perform, etc. And that's and that scares me a bit with the DSLs that the code generation is is kind of a yeah feels a bit like a black box, and you don't. I'm I'm scared that at some point I don't know uh, what is going to be produced, uh, why it doesn't work, or what. Uh, so the more of debugging for purposes, so, so to say. Yeah, so debugging comes up quite a lot. Um, obviously, we've given presentations. Um, and, and, and people also think it's magic as well. They think you're doing magic by generating things out of nothing. But of course, none of that is true. I think from, um, obviously it's different between the two DSLs, but from, from Cyclone's point of view, we are, we are reusing existing code and we are um, generating Fortran, which is, it's, it's relatively, I would say relatively clear um, what it does, it's relatively traditional, whether that's a good or a bad thing, you can, you, we can argue. Um, so, uh, and, and what we don't, we, you, can, you can just output, uh, and then Dawn you can as well, you can output um, essentially vanilla code, so it, it, and, and, um, and then you can, you can layer on the optimizations afterwards. So obviously, if you've got lots of optimizations in, it's going to look very different, but if you don't put those on, it'll still be a functioning code, and you can see, and that's easier to understand than there. And look, I think that's at least partially an answer to your question. And also, can I ask, maybe send a question back, like, I'm not sure about if the library solution allows you to have more control over it, because, I don't know, at some point we were trying to debug something for our system on the Envap page library, and it's a library, but, but it's so low level, it's so attached to the hardware, and we are all relying on MPI, right? And if something goes wrong, and things go wrong sometimes, and there are bugs, and uh, yeah, yeah, you need like, like a really strong support and vendors uh, to be involved. And... Def yeah, so it, definitely, uh, uh, it's, it, of course, it can be a pain to to debug, uh, uh, yeah, to debug a low-level library. I, I fully agree. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, that's that's true. And and it's it's just that the the to debug the SI or the intermediate representations. It's for me. It's also it's quite difficult to to look at, at them uh, because that's where, where I would look if, if if something happens that I wouldn't expect and uh, I think maybe some visualization of it or some kind of uh, inspection tools uh, could really help out maybe there so is, is that a comment just to dusk and dawn or is that also a comment to cyclones it's more, I think, to what the end of because Python I think, is closer to the code itself, right? So it's closer to to the Fortran itself, uh, and the Dusk and Dawn is a much more high, higher level, I would say. So there, the translation is is really important, I guess, to to the bare metal code. Uh, Yeah, it's very good. It's a really good point, right? Also in lines with the previous uh, feedback that we got, like some visualization or some tooling, right? Actually, to help the developer will be essential. Good. So, Carlos, I uh, didn't write down this question because it's uh, a little bit convoluted, but can I just chime in here? Of course. Okay, so uh, no one has talked about the elephant in the room so far, which is the maintainability and extensibility of these tools. That's a little bit surprising. You know, we've we've encountered lots of really great tools, and 
they didn't find adoption because you know they did not survive right the person who wrote them then left the institution or whatever uh and you know not only for you know the you know examples from um, from graduate students but for example open acc and the cray compiler right they were all uh, trying to convince us cray was trying to convince us open acc is the way to go in 2010 and six years later they said oh yeah well we're transitioning to uh, openmp 4 dot x and uh, why don't you just write rewrite every all your open acc code in openmp so it's you know a real risk for probably everyone all the developers who are participating now to use uh, a tool like this if they don't know exactly the future and i know and i mean these are really elegant tools i mean i was really impressed with cyclone and the fact that you can sort of incrementally use your existing fortran code but then incrementally move to more dsl style and of course i think everyone agrees that dusk dawn is a really elegant way to uh, work on um, unstructured grids, but the question is, you know, how much faith do you do you have that the tool will be around in um, you know five years during the duration of our uh, software development? And you could say, okay, well, you know, we're committed to um, Nemo and, and Elfric, and so this tool will exist, but you know, for my application, maybe there need to be extensions, which are not currently in Cyclone. Um, and, you know, which, how willing will you be to uh, make those extensions? Uh, and of course, the other thing is, you know, maybe in five years, you say, well, we're moving, we're transitioning from Cyclone to Tsunami now, right? And where does that leave uh, me as a developer? So, um, yeah, I wonder if you could say something to that. Why, or maybe some of the other participants, how willing would you be to use a tool like this, not knowing exactly if it's going to be around uh, in, say, five years? Yeah, and that, that, that's actually, I think, question five is sort of asking a similar question in, in, the, in Google Docs, which is, what's the future of it? Yeah. And you're right. Um, and it is, it is, it is often asked. Again, it's one of the questions at the end of a presentation that uh, usually Carlos or or one of Carlos' colleagues or myself or Andy give presentations, and this, it's it's usually asked this question. Um, I think you answered it partially for for um, for, for cycling. Um, what we can say is the Met Office are committed to supporting it, um, and um, and because it will go in their operational model, assuming that uh, Elfric does go operational, which looks looking likely. So that's going to be on, ongoing. Um, the, the only reason, really, the Met Office put some effort in, um, out with funding at Nemo, which is where most of the funding's come from, um, is because it was already used um, in Alfric. So there is this kind of, if it's being used, then we might continue to put more effort in. So that is one of the, the, the points. Um, another thing to, for, you, you mentioned, um, would we be willing to to add things in ourselves? Then, 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 yeah, yes, yes, of course. I mean, but obviously, um, we have to do things that we're paid to do, uh, funded to do, uh, and we're we're always um, keen to to add extra things in. And, and you know, this this is something. Um, the fact that software we're we're developing is being used is key for for, for my interest, to be honest. Um, so the more more it's used, the better. Um, but of course, um, there are limits to that. And so, what what do you typically do? I mean, it's true in general. Um, we we try and get we try and get funding for that is one option. So there are there is the obviously if it's a community tool, then you try and get funding through the kind of the ENIS European route. That's one option. And, and the other one is that um, all of our codes are open source, and uh, and and we are, we already are in in in, um, in Cyclone definitely a community developing. Um, the code. So, so I mean, the, the other way to do it is if we can't do it and we're not funded to do it, then we would we would be very happy for contributions for specific things from others. I mean, that's the that's that's the standard open source way of of, um, of, of continuing code. So that's the other option. Um, I think that's probably all um, I could say about that. So let me yeah. just add to it to uh, maybe provoke the dusk dawn people. 
what I'm interested in is the development of dynamical cores using discontinuous Galerkin. And I think this came up at some point. You don't have the support in there for these um, elemental operations, right? These little uh, uh, linear algebra operations. But of course, you could put it in. But like Rupert just mentioned, what is the motivation to do that? To put those uh, if they uh, uh, those elements, those operations in, if you're not directly funded for that, right? So maybe that's a question for the Dusk and Dawn people, how they see the extensibility of Dusk and Dawn. Maybe I can maybe I can also take that um, since I mean you were also asking that question, right? I think recently on the Icon Developer Meeting. I mean we are developing all these very strongly connected to. Uh, or within the ICON community, uh, these tools. First of all, to be able to build a demonstration for a model, a real model that is that is put in production. I, I don't think that we can say that we are at the place where we are offering the tools and the DSLs to the community to start using it, right? And to engage into and to start porting models and even more to put things in production. I think that's still a long way until until we are, the, we, we are there. Uh, for sure, in the easy ways community, we promote that. It's very essential that the model developers and the community is engaged and involved in this, so that this feedback that we are getting here, for example, is essential. So it's just for the developments of the DSL itself and to start paving the future for what it might come. But the model for maintenance and long-term maintenance of these tools is, is not there yet. So from Metasuite's point of view, what our aim would be is to put a dynamical code in production. Also from our experience, putting something in production is really the milestone that proves that, you're, that you have a maintainable and sustainable future for the model. Then the rest of the question is about the funding, of course. But until you don't have things in production, then you have only a demonstration. And, and as you were saying, right? I mean, many things when you have in production and there's a request to do something or there is the request to solve the bug, this is that has to be solved in a production kind of timeline. Uh, so this is this is why it's, it's so essential. But at the same time, we constrain it to the configuration that we are aiming at putting in production. Um, because if you attend to requests uh, that are coming from different models, then the things really diversifies a lot, and the effort that takes to maintain the tool uh, when you have these continuous galerkins and you have finite volumes and you have different meshes, it, it can be considerably large. So for that, I completely agree with you. You need a business model. You need a model for for the future to maintain and sustain these these tools in the long term. And I completely agree with you that uh, rewriting a model will take at least uh, a model like Icon at least will take five years. So you only do that effort when you know that this, the, the basis of the tools are solid, uh, that they are going to be available in the future with the, with the proper business model. I don't know if that's answering your question, but basically I'm saying that that is not contradictory with the fact that the community should be engaged today. That doesn't mean that your production codes need to be ported today, but somehow the community needs to engage into the development phase of it. Otherwise, we will get something that has not been following really the requirements or or the feedback of the model developers. But that doesn't mean that, again, Dask and Dawn is today at the point where we would like to offer it to people so that people, for sure, people can use it, but there is not just a support model. It's open source, so if people is really interested, they could hook into and then provide funding for extending it and for complementing all this. Is, is, uh, the team is very open to that for sure as an open source development but there is no guarantee to support for example these continuous alerts or, or, or all the things that are not in the current roadmap so what you're saying is you're limiting yourself to dusk and dawn being the icon die core tool basically as, as a demonstration right as a demonstration that could in the future uh, lead to a more general dsl for the community that can be used but I mean, also from from our experience like starting with a really broad set of requirements trying to support everything it's uh it's a really challenging model because again probably you go more to a general purpose solution and probably the year for is like around 30 people and several years right to, to provide that so the other point i wanted to bring up uh and then i'll shut up i promise 
uh, <laughs> is to look at the model a little bit more holistically. And we have physics, we have interpolations, we have post-processing, we have I.O., we have advection as well as the dynamical core, right? And I think in the case of Cyclone, I sort of see it, right? That, you know, you can incrementally, you have all your Dusty Deck Fortran code and you can sort of incrementally move that uh, parts of it to a more DSL-like approach. So I think I see the idea in Cyclone. As far as, as Dawn and Dusk goes, uh, you know, it's, it's a very elegant tool, but what are you suggesting for the other components? And you, we can't say at this point, oh, we'll just implement those in OpenACC or OpenMP5.x. Uh, that worked maybe 10 years ago, but no longer, right? So we have to think of the, the entire model. What would you guys, the Matthew Swiss guys, say to that? I think I probably referred the question to Giacomo, but let me clarify one question also probably so that the Cyclone people could hook into. Um, I'm not sure, is it different? Because also Cyclone is a DSL, so you need to respect the model of the DSL. For example, what do you do with data simulation if you don't have OpenACC? And then probably prefer the so that people can answer, Giacomo or Rupert? Do you, want me, do you want me to answer that question in particular, or should we answer Will's general question first, if that mind? As you prefer. I think there was a direct question to the integration of Dusk and Dawn for Giacomo, but the other one is also for you. So you could go ahead, Rupert. Okay, um, so, so so you're asking about other, other models, and, and you, you, you mentioned DA in particular. Um, so, as, as Andy said, um, we've, we've been asked to look at, at other models. I mean, the, these are essentially the other models in the, the Met Office at the moment, really. So, so um, you, you can think of the Met Office as a microcosm for other things. And, and as you've seen, we started off being asked to do, um, well, starting off, off looking at Nemo, and, um, and, and they, they have a next generation modeling systems plan, NGMS plan, which is where everything has to work on in exascale, essentially. Um, and um, and we're involved in 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 some of that and um, and as you can see uh, from what Andy said um, a number of the, um, the 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 extra bits of the models uh, for Nemo are being looked at as well um, not all of them I mean Wave Watch for example is something we're not looking at um, so so we can't claim we're, we're covering everything um, but but in, in particular in the um, in the data simulation. Um, We've actually just started discussing um, with data assimilation people. This is one of the other things I wanted to bring bring out is, is when you have a DSL, you can potentially help with um, creating your joints. So we're 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 starting to look, or we're hoping to get some funding to start to look at um, helping to um, at least partially, or maybe even fully, automating the generation of the joint for the DA if you're doing 3D or 4D var uh, from from the original model, and that's a big advantage. That no one else will be. I mean, I know that um, the um, MIT GCM sort of does something like that, but pretty much no one does that. They all write their own. So that's one area where you you could use a DSL-like approach to help for for DA. Um, I think I think beyond that, they're they're looking at using Jedi as 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 an, an environment, and we would have to see. I think from the, our point of view, the DSL is just a single model. Um, here, so I think we can just think of it as helping with the single model, and then other environments around that are separate to what we're doing. That would be my summary of of, um, of where we're up to at the moment. You can follow if I can follow that up. I get the point of the agile model, for example, because in the end it's kind of a model and it's very similar. But I was referring probably more to like observations, right? Like for example, I don't know. You can really have very exotic algorithms. You can have a spiral around a station, like looking for at some neighbors around a spiral. Really exotic things that would not feel the realm of stencils or finer elements or things like that. Or don't you have that in in Alfred? Um Yes, I think so. Um, you're right. So, so there are. I mean, so, so cyclone. Um, is um, so the Alfred model is is really a, a CG model in a, in a certain style and um, and uh, we could in theory do DG as well if someone wanted to buy into that style um, but essentially Alfred the the Alfred interface is 
is just an interface to one model, really, because there aren't any other models like it. Um, if someone else wanted to write something then um, that was similar, then they could reuse all of that, of course, and they're very welcome to, but there aren't, there's no one else at the moment. Um, the, the Nemo API, and maybe Andy can chime in more with this, is kind of more flexible because in some ways we're just taking a, a code which has loop nests and I think we, we assume certain things about the structures of those, but really we're not we're not that limited to whether it's one dimensional or two dimensional or three dimensional or whatever it could even be n dimensional um so so that, that potentially there's there's an ability to expand um that that kind of lower level support for fortran to things beyond just finite if, if, if they are loops of certain types and that's where all the work is then they're things we could potentially do in the future not at the moment but in in the future um so so yeah there is some scope for expanding there there in the future but at the moment you're right we we really are aiming at certain classes and and um and if you're outside of that then then we don't support it i mean particles for example we're, we're not we're no we're, we're not trying to support particle based dispersion based stuff you know we, we know, mm -hmm. you know that someone else has to do that all right thanks and giacomo can you take the second yeah. part of the question yeah absolutely i, I think uh this is a very good point um so so far we, we we kind of modeled the current concepts uh, around the the dicor without considering tracers so far. Um, so I, I don't know very well the the other kinds of code that you can uh, find in a model, but I will say as long as you don't break the the concept of a, of a stencil, you should already be good with the concept that you have, uh, even if you let's say need to break the, the concept of a, of a stencil um let's say if, if you if this is an operation that that you have to do not so often um so that maybe that doesn't count too much towards uh the the final performance uh this is still something that we that we can uh extend the dsl with um and thus maybe not providing the the most optimized there but um, with respect to let's say a stencil formulation of the of the problem, um, but I wouldn't say that this would break completely uh, the IRs, for example. And really, we I think we tried to show that we are very flexible. Uh, for example, with Dusk, we, we can really uh, add syntax, uh, add sugar, syntax sugar there, uh, uh, and uh, then of course this needs to map into SIR and IIR and if uh, those need to be extended of course we, we can still do that and um, due maybe to our modularity uh, we, we can be uh, um, let's say quick about that uh, so I, I would say if it, if it doesn't break the, 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 the stencil concept um, it, it should be already already good but maybe you have some some example uh, in mind that uh, instead it goes the other direction no sure it doesn't break the the paradigm because there is no stencil right uh, physics is essentially has no uh, horizontal dependencies there are only vertical dependencies so i you could theoretically apply uh, dusk and dawn to that uh, the question is, do, do you want to, or should there be some other concept which is more um, uh, designed for um, for physics? For example, there's this claw tool, right? And they, you can make single column abstractions with this claw tool. Now, aesthetically, I would think that's a more appropriate tool to implement the physics but maybe you see that differently maybe you want to do dusk uh code for the physics i don't is is that what you're suggesting yeah i, I think we, we discussed this internally at least once um and we, we we said we we could give it a try to also um uh, maybe try to express some physics with, with uh the current concepts as as you mentioned this is not even a stencil it's just a column um and uh and I think, yeah, maybe um, maybe I reiterate on this, but uh, if if there is a better syntax to of the language uh, to to express uh, the physics, and maybe this maps well uh, into already existent SAR, uh, this is even a trivial change for us to just adopt Dusk and and not Dawn. 
I mean, also you were bringing, if I can hook into here, I mean, you were bringing Will in the question, right? The, one of the critical points, like Clo relies also a lot on OpenACC um, or any other programming model, right? And the question is also what happened in the future. Yeah, we always hope that there is going to be some kind of directive based approach in the future that will work and that that approach should be sustainable. But the other question is the sustainability of the tool. Um, like how many you can afford for different domains and whether it makes sense to have one or multiple ones. And I think this is not so clear, but uh, we were inclined to kind of to say that the front ends are the, the ones that are typically more lightweight and then Clo is like, a, it's mostly like a front end for, for Fortran. Uh, so well, the back end is actually very lightweight because it simply rely on, on OpenCC. And um, it would be possible well, that, to that's, have to that's ambition. The current, current form of it, Carlos. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion for multiple backends to claw, right? That's, uh, there sure, are also that's possibilities it. for the backend. Well, that's what I'm saying, probably, right? That you could imagine a model where you have a front end that is similar to claw that exposes uh, column based obstructions to Fortran, and the backend could be the same thing. But then my question would go back like, why do you need multiple backends if a single parallel model is actually valid for the patterns that you encounter in the physics and the patterns that you encounter in the dynamics? And the physics is only a subset of the dynamics. I mean, fr from um, Cyclone's point of view, Chlor is much closer, but it's quite similar in some ways. And in fact, we we um, we did spend quite a lot of time trying to integrate Chlor and and, and and Cyclone together, we were going to use um, Claw's inter internal representation instead of our own um, as, as a kind of the, the means for doing optimizations. The, the reason we didn't end up doing that is because it is um, sitting in Fortran. And for our, for our needs, um, we needed to be, it was beneficial to be a higher level. And in fact, we needed to do that for a particular project actually. But I mean, I think in general, it's better to go language independent if you can. Because I think there there will be some C C plus um, plus solutions out there which might might be at least as good and maybe give us more more portability in the future. So I think that's why we ended up not using Claw. I completely agree that Claw is a great tool and and could be sustained and used for physics. Um, and in fact, I think that's the current main thought um, by the Met Office at the moment for the physics. Um, it, if not, it's possible. Um, Cyclone could essentially try and replicate in some way what Claw does, um, and, and that might be something that we'll do. I mean, we already do um, use Cyclone to to um, to call the physics, so Cyclone is being used in the physics. It's the whole model, not just a dynamical core. Um, so that's something we could do. But uh, but I do agree. I think I think for for physics, having a code manipulation tool at the moment is is a good idea. I don't really think that, that having a DSL is a sh there's a short-term answer to this. I think it's um, I think it's it's possible, and 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 but it would require a lot of a lot of work and a lot of development. I think we should be looking at supporting what's there now. Uh, and I, I'm glad Will's nodding because I mean I, I agree with him. Yeah, I'm good. Can I pick, uh, are there any other questions? Um, you still have probably some five more minutes. Uh, I think I also would say that like comments and feedbacks so to get are very welcome as well, right? I think also just having this be a, like a discussion rather than not just a QA, and a um, just, just uh, so everyone knows. But sorry, I think Rene, you wanted to say something. Yeah, uh, we already asked that, but I think that wasn't really answered because at the end of the day, the climate scientists want to have their grip files on that GDF files on this. And I can't see right now how this is achieved. And as, as Will stated with the, with the Cyclone, I, I, I see the way to, to that. But with Dusk and Dawn, I, I don't get it for now. Can you elaborate more the question? What do you mean that at the end of the day, yeah, yeah you I mean, the you, data, you, right? you run yeah, your, yeah. your die core and assume you have your physics also written in dusk and dawn, but at the end of the day, I want to have, or the climate scientists want to have the data, the solutions written into files. 
n. So the, it's a, the question, the link to the I.O. library in this case. Maybe I, I can uh, briefly comment um, because um, we, we ex uh, started exploring the option of uh, CDI and net CDF um, mm. for uh, as first for debugging purposes. So uh, basically having a, in a serial format, serialize our, our fields. Um, then um, well, we went for a quicker, a quicker way, but uh, I think we, we, we still have in mind to, to explore that. Uh, and I, I would say uh, it is very well possible, although uh, of course there is no, no implementation so far. Uh, to have as outputs to, to let's say, introduce in the, C, in the DSL um, a simple serialized, deserialized call. I, I would think this is uh, not at all uh, a difficult objective. But this is really for like helping, for helping debugging, visualizing, and all that. But I think the question of Rene is probably like, how do you go about bringing this into a model with, with all the functionality? And this, I would say, is probably the same separation of concerns that we were talking, like it depends on on what are you targeting with the DSL. With the DSL, you are targeting the die core. The rest of icon is the rest of icon, right? Physics can retain, can be remaining in Fortran. And the IO library is CDI, uh, you use the same IO library, and the communication library is the same communication library. Um, so the communication, IO, they are properly sold by libraries, and you don't need a DSL for that. DSL is just a replacement of the computations that they need to run on different architectures. So, so IO is not something that runs on a GPU, for example. So there is no innovation or no change in there uh, within a model. And what you could imagine is that the DSL could eventually replace the die core, and then the rest of the model infrastructure could be similar or different, but uh, designed in a similar way. But you could replace more parts of the computations as we were discussing before, physics and so on, but there will be parts that in the end you do IO in the in same fashion as you do today or in a different way, but this I don't think is the problem of the DSL. Maybe to illustrate the problem with some of the issues in ICON, uh, you're right what you say about the IO library, that will be the same IO library. But there are considerable amounts of code which are not part of the physics, not part of the dynamics or the advection, where, for example, the fields which are on the device have to be moved to the host. There are things like um, derived variables, right? Variables which are derived from say, other diagnostics or from prognostic variables. And you want to do, they're on the device. And they, that calculation really has to be done also on the device, has nothing to do with the physics, has nothing to do with the dynamics, it's all part of the diagnostics. So there, Renee's point is good, there are going to be large parts of the code, not maybe the IO library, but things close to the IO library, which have to be implemented on the GPU also, right, on, on the device also. No, and it's a good point, right? I, I, I think what we can say is that at this point in time, I mean, the DSL needs to have a focus, and that's not the focus. So like, the DSL is not replacing a general purpose programming model for accelerators, right? And this is what I was saying before, right? I mean, there are many more things than what you were describing. There are a like, lot of algorithms in the data simulation that, in my opinion, are not going to fit in a DSL, and it's not whether you support it or not. It's just I think that this is, can be really creative, and they, it just doesn't fit. So I don't think that the DSL is replacing an entire model. Maybe like an ecosystem, like uh, could do not the DSL, but the DSL combined with library, combined with another programming model. But it's not certainly the goal of the DSL to replace what OpenECC can do. That 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 would be a bit uh, off topic. But that that's the point. We don't want to just say, oh, we'll do the rest in OpenACC because OpenACC has its own longevity issues. So we have to think of perhaps other tools to do these diagnostics, to do other tools to do the physics. And I think we shouldn't lose sight of that. I mean, this is a great tool, dusk and dawn, but perhaps we need another tool to do the physics or an yet another tool to do the diagnostics. Sure, absolutely. Or a general purpose programming model. Maybe OpenCC doesn't exist, but there will be something else. Um, 
there is also many other programming models we did not discuss. There is Cycle, there is, uh, yeah, there are really options out there. But the, the point of the DSO was also the portability and performance portability because the particularity of the DICOR and the physics is that they are really expensive. And this is what you want to get most of the time so that you compute the model efficiently fast and you can go to the exascale, right? That, that's the main point. And then you can relax a little bit more of your constraints on performance portability for other aspects. What you want is sometimes to compute diagnostic, but they are very cheap. Sometimes they are even 2D computations, so you don't care so much no, about that, the performance that, and then you can use other they're, stuff. They're mistaken, Carlos. I mean, the, the diagnostics are not necessarily cheap. These derived variable calculations, they have to run on the accelerator. So that, that I, is not correct. I, I'm not saying they don't have to run on the accelerator. Of course, if you run sequential and if you're running one core on the CPU, they are going to dominate. I'm not saying they don't need to run on the accelerator. I'm saying compared to the die core, in a time step also is higher. So you run every nth time step. So compared to the die core, it cannot be that if you're spending 60% of your time in the diagnostic, I would say there is no, something. Not that, I admit. Yeah. Any other questions or remarks? I think there was a number six question came up on the. Ah, thanks. So David, um, from what I can see, DSL are good to express numerical formulations and the compilers like Dawn, Cyclone can perform some optimizations, can insert OpenMP or OpenSCC directives and can translate the code to some backends like Litus, Atlas, etc. So where do you think we should work from the performance point of view? Like better vectorization, like better support for distributed memory architecture? Not sure here the question is intended to like the DSL itself, like the backend or Maybe if you can take the mic, David, to clarify. Yeah, that'd be useful. Who, who is we here? Yeah, do you hear me? Yep. Hi. Okay, yeah, um, yeah I was wondering what uh, uh, what we can do to, to optimize uh, generated code and to support uh, uh, distributed uh, uh, distributed computation uh, like MPI on multi nodes or multi GPU. Do you think we have to work on the back end, or do you think it's easier to introduce this uh, this kind of thing in the in the compilers? I'm not sure I'm clear, but uh... mm -hmm. Cooper, you wanted to answer? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I mean, I think the answer is the back end, um, and, and I think, um, I think both both systems already do this. Um, I think, I think, um, Dawn um, has has more ability to to do optimizations like vectorization, things like that, because it has a better control of the data layout uh, in in Cyclone because we we support existing code um, that has um, a data layout associated with it, so it's harder for us to to do certain optimizations. And that's one of the trade-offs uh, between these things. But yeah, very much so. I mean, the whole point about the DSL is it, it it knows about the domain and it can optimize for that domain. So I think the optimizations um, would be in the back end um, and should and, and hopefully we've kind of shown that in our at least in the cyclone um, part of this that that you can apply optimizations and leave the original code as it is, and we will continue to to extend those optimizations as uh, as time goes on. Hopefully that's answering. I'm not quite sure, but hopefully. Maybe I can add uh, something to that. Um, so maybe purely from the point of view of optimizing um, stances, I think there's kind of two aspects that we want to take care of. Um, and first of all, there's some kind of general optimizations we want to do. Um, such as vectorization or um, making sure that our memory accesses are coalesced. Um, we, we saw a, a bit of that. How, well, we saw what of those things matter from Giacomo's um, presentations. Um, and I mean, we kind of always want to make sure that we get that right. 
And the thing is, this is a kind of, this is not like this job will never really be done because new GPUs will have new features and they have different sizes of caches and, and they, they have different rules of how the memory gets transformed. So you kind of, you kind of you always have to put some work into there as new hardware comes up. Um, and those, those are kind of general optimizations you where you always have to spend or where you always can Im improve kind of. And the second thing is also there's these optimizations which are very, very specific to stencils. And an example would be stencil inlining. Um, and that's a very, like, the, like the, this stencil inlining, it's, it only works for stencils, right? If you if you, you do matrix multiplications or, or other linear algebra operations, then stencil inlining, if you were to apply it analogously, you would probably trash your performance completely, right? And when it comes to optimizing stencils, the, the, this, the research is not done there either. I think there is, um, there, there, there's still a, a very active field of, of research where new things get figured out. And maybe to, to make this a bit more specific. So Giacomo um, showed us like there's different ways we can optimize it, right? There's different transformations that we can do. And when you, when you write your stencils, the compiler sees the stencil and now it can, it could do maybe 10 different transformations, right? And kind of the order how you do them, it matters. And, and like you, you don't just kind of monotonically increase the performance with, with every uh, um, transformation. At some point you, there, there's like, uh, there's like forks where you, well, either you do one transformation or, or the other, but you cannot, you cannot do both together and deciding which transformations to apply where it's, it's a very, it's a very, very hard task. And um, traditionally in compiler design, and this is also true for compilers like GCC or um, LLVM um, and like kind of the popular compilers. Traditionally, this has been done by, by kind of heuristics um, hand tuned by, by compiler engineers. So in a way, there's like some arbitrary choices being made that people figured out kind of work out well in practice. Um, but, but these are really hard choices and, and maybe um, to add on top of that, there's like also, for example, research being done to apply um, artificial intelligence to that, to make better choices with these, um, uh, to make better, to make smarter choices. And then this is a very active research area. And I think, um, so, so yeah, on, on those two, both levels on the kind of the stencil specific level and on the general kind of, let's say GPU level in, in our case, that this, the, there's active research in both and there's always new things you can do. And, and I think it makes sense to do that because at the end of the day, that does um, improve your performance and, and that's, um, that's very beneficial. Right. Thank you very much. Then I suggest, well, if there is interest, we can continue, but probably we should start, the, uh, start closing the session and indeed the, the whole week is finishing here. Someone has something pressing, just shout out. What I'd I like to say. I'd just like to say you guys did an incredible job on the tutorials. I mean, I, I think everyone appreciates how much work goes into those tutorials and you did a really phenomenal job preparing them. They were really interesting. I learned a lot personally. Just wanted to say that. I'm sure the others feel the same way. Thank you, Will. Yeah, thank you. Was that just for Dusk and Dawn and, and uh, Cyclone was rubbish, or was that for both? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to ask questions like that, Rupert. <laughs> no, no, I want to know. <laughs> if we're rubbish, I'd like to know. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the feedback. Certainly appreciate it. I also wanted to say something in the same lines. I did not prepare material, so, so I can say that. Uh, but I have seen it, actually, how much work they put into it. And, and I mean, these guys are fantastic. They They are mainly developers and normally education is probably the, the least priority or shouldn't be. But I'd say this time they really did a fantastic job in trying to make something didactical, um, imagining like the people they, they, they were teaching to and, and really so that, uh, really worry about the quality of the, of the material and so that the, the learning experience is actually also fun. So thanks a lot to all the speakers, not only for the week that you took in here, but all the work that you did while developing the tutorial the tutorials and on all the material then thanks also a lot to dkr set to dela to claudia for all the support it went like super smooth no technical problems even though we are all remote and online it was really fantastic all the support that we got so 
Yeah, exactly. Big applause. Thanks a lot for making it smooth. We hope that um, the recordings actually work, and, and that was the idea that you <laughs> you again can. Yeah. Hi, Bella. We <laughs> didn't see you. Hi, Claudia. Um, so we hope again that this is working, and if so, the idea is that we will put all the materials, so the slides, plus the videos um, online. They will have to go as open educational resources, so something like Creative Commons or freely available, so that you can also go back to it in case you want to, I don't know, repeat or learn something. I think all the, the whole environment is going to be around for some time. Um, like the, the software stack of Cyclone and Dusk and Dawn. Eventually, um, I guess this is like a frozen version of the code, like Jupyter Notebooks or the versions that you got for Cyclone. Eventually, it is not going to be maintained or to be seen. So eventually, it might stop working, but for some time, you will have it around. And in the worst case, those tools are going to be continued to develop and they are open source. But the only thing is that you need to replicate the environment and compile again with your tools uh, on your own, right? Like I'm talking about the environment itself that can be uh, obsolete at some point, like the Jupyter Notebooks. Good. Um, so again, we will reach you out with uh, with an email. First of all, we would like to send around a survey. It would really help us if you give us some feedback about the, about the training since uh, potentially we will repeat that in other contexts or, or to other people. So it would really help. I mean, one of the things is that we could not see faces, we could not see like people really struggling or saying, aha, uh -huh, where are we? So that was a bit difficult. So it would help us still if offline, you can give us some hints and being, I mean, we don't need, can be anonymous. It's just like some feedback about, about the material so that we can improve it. At the same time, we'll give you a way to contact uh, people. It's not saying that we are giving support to production tools or so, but we are glad to get feedback and we are glad to help if people still want to want to use them. I think I can say that the Slack will also be, at some point we will close it, uh, uh, but probably we can keep it for some time, right? Like Rupert, Andy, did you think about that? Uh, also that in case, I see it's uh, on people... the 30 day free free trial, isn't it? So I guess it lasts 30 days. Okay, then that is a natural <laughs> deadline. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. But probably then if you agree, then people can still ask questions or use the Slack to, to contact um, the developers, but we will give other ways. Uh, last thing probably I wanted to share. Daisy Ways, all this is coming from the, I guess people can see now my screen. This was funded by Easy Ways, as you know. Of course, I wanted to encourage people also, if you found this interesting, to follow Easy Ways, the community. And in particular, there are quite some other trainings, not only this one. So you can go here into events, and yes, you will see that this is the one that, that we are having right now. I'm finishing, but you can also click on the path, and you will see probably some other things were interesting, like this high performance data analytics and visualization. There was a summer school. There is always something happening, so I'd encourage people also to follow um, the project and, uh, and, and contact also there is a mailing list in case you'd like to subscribe. With that, I think that's all I wanted to say. Maybe I leave the floor to, if I miss something, some final remarks from, from the speakers or from the organizers from uh, De La Claudia. Anyone would like to say anything? No, uh, maybe also we are good. Just, just want to say thank, thanks to everyone for attending. I know you're thanking us, but uh, without you, it would have been quite an empty uh, thing to <laughs> do all these tutorials and not have anyone. So, you know, thanks for sticking with us, um, and uh, and we hope um, you've enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thanks for the great audience. I hope um, we stay in touch, and um, be exciting to see what the future brings. Right. <laughs> Fantastic. Then thanks everyone again. And I think we can close it here. I hope you, you really had like a, an interesting and, and fun week. And now you deserve actually the weekend, the beer, and the, yeah, take some rest. Thanks everyone. Then we can close. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, thanks everyone. everyone. Thanks. See you guys. Nice Bye. 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 Bye.
This conference will now be recorded. <laughs> hey, sorry, that was me. <laughs>